shut down as well. And then I guess the country goes into a permanent destabilization where they can play the literal right and left off the two different sides of the country. Uh, uh, the right from the, the West and the Russian from the, uh, from the East and then just use that as a tool of political control. I know Russia to a certain extent collaborates with the EU, but is against the Anglo-American British U.S. power bloc. Explain the strategy there. Well, the strategy is remember that Russia has always intended to strike the West. They want to run their own new world order with them in control. We've got a temporary pact with China to join with them to control the world, and they'll have to fight it out. Whatever, and they don't, haven't gone that far down the road. But the, the goal is to take down the, the hegemony of the West. And, uh, but they're not ready to do that yet. So what I'm saying is it's very important to understand that in the status quo that was going on before, be, uh, last Friday and before, was that the pro-Western Western Ukrainians were the beleaguered ones, and Russia was the bad guys. That's all the news kept saying. The Russia has ironclad control of Ukraine, and the Westerners want to be free. The Russians are the bad guys. Now it's been reversed. And this is why this really plays to Russia's favor. Because if they want to postpone the eventual taking back of the Soviet states, uh, whether it's Czechoslovakia, Poland, uh, Ukraine, Georgia, etc., instead of playing like they're independent. If they want to take them back with force someday. They've got to wait till they're militarily ready to take on the West, and they're not. So we've got several years that they've got to bide their time. So, But in order to do that, you've got to play the same game that Hitler played by attacking his own people, the Germans, in Poland and uh, in uh, Czechoslovakia in order to justify that intrusion. It's too early for that justification. Everybody keeps thinking Russia's going to attack Ukraine right now, to take it back, and it's too early. It's going to make Russia look very, very bad. Uh, they want more disarmament with the West. The West wants more unilateral disarmament with Russia to make sure that they pave the way for this uh, war. And so what they've got to do is slow the process down. Now what happened after uh, Saturday's phony coup? Now the Eastern Russians are the beleaguered people. And it's the Western Ukraine that's going to be the bad guys. That's why they had to have all of the, the uh, pro-Russian majority in the Rada and the parliament resign so that now it can be a majority of pro-Western people. They can get the blame for everything. Plus the fact this allows the West to come to the rescue of Ukraine's bankruptcy. I mean, Ukraine is literally bankruptcy. They instituted currency controls today. The West, just like in the former Soviet Union, they're going to take over all of the payments and give bailout money to them. Russians are loving this. Um, but the most important thing to remember now is that for now on in advance, the Russian, uh, the Western the phony opposition, these are run by Russians, but they're going to be claiming to be pro-EU. They're going to get the blame for everything that happens now. You're not going to see Eastern Ukraine and the Crimea secede. You're not going to see ind independence. And here's why. If they were to become independent, these majoritarian Russian populations in Eastern Ukraine and Crimea, Everybody would be happy. The Western Ukrainians would be happy, and so would the Easterns, and you wouldn't have conflict anymore. What you're going to see is Russia's going to accept some sort of some type of federalization, which means that uh, they're going to be federalized under a Ukrainian nation, but that means that the Eastern portions will always be able to complain in the future about being underrepresented and, and oppressed by the dominant Western government. And eventually they can tweak that with protesters and with the ongoing unrest so that in a couple of years, maybe three or four years, when they do want to take back Ukraine, they'll have the justification to do that. So do you see what I'm saying? You're going to have a much better permanent system of conflict by allowing Western Ukraine to go in, ostensibly to go into Western hands, when in fact it is Russian puppets playing as if they're in Western hands. I want to come back and talk about Georgia and then take phone calls on the waterfront about uh, strategy of the globalist, where you see that going. Michael wants to ask you about U.S. flags being banned in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals if the illegals find them offensive. Ray wants to uh, ask you some other questions. Folks want to ask about smart tech and all the surveillance grid, the NSA. So Joel Scalzen of WorldAffairsBrief.com is our guest.
I'm Alex Jones of InfoWars.com on this live Friday edition. And I'll be back this Sunday, Lord willing, 4 to 6 p.m. with the Sunday live transmission right here on GCN. At in bulk at cost. Uh, so you can hand out to friends and family as low as a dollar a piece, big glossy color magazine. And half the magazine is about chemicals, biologicals, radiologicals to basically drug the population to make us very, very easy to control in the globalist own words. So a great thing to give people so they understand why there's a war on men. And when we finish up with Georgia and then go to phone calls, I want to ask, uh, I never asked Joel his view on this, see if he agrees with me or if he sees that message out there, what's, what's behind that. But uh, going back to Joel Skousen, uh, Joel, uh, so, so what is the larger, let's spend 10 minutes then go to calls. On the three power blocks, undoubtedly the globalists in their own documents say that is the power blocks. Uh, you're very accurate in that research. So what are the power blocks up to? What does this Ukraine thing mean? When will Russia be ready for the strike? Will they strike us with China? And go, but start off with Georgia, because from what I looked at, that was a real attack. What was that about? Well, that was. That was the West uh, in combination with Israel, because, uh, you know, what the West does to have plausible deniability about directly giving military arms to something to exacerbate the Russian uh, and former Soviet state situation. They use Israel. Israel, a lot of Americans don't realize that they use Israel to, to send a lot of military technology to China, which is going to be our number one enemy someday, uh, even more, you know, greater than Russia. And uh, people would be incensed if they knew that uh, Israel had a green light to transfer technology to China. But they also did it to Abkhazia and South Ossetia. These are the two um, semi-autonomous regions of Georgia that wanted to defect and become independent. And, of course, the West normally does, you know, like to encourage independence. Uh, but really, they knew that Russia wasn't going to let uh, let that happen. And they did that to simply tweak Russia. Russia did, in fact, have to use military power to come in because of the fact that um, they had mil Israeli advisors in there. They It looked to them like they were really trying to use military force to break away. This is entirely different than what happened in the Ukraine. Remember, the opposition has no military forces, none whatsoever, maybe even a handful of hunting rifles. There's no way that they could have done a coup, and that's why Russia has no reason to come in and to do a military, uh, you know, invasion to retake Ukraine. And, and so you're saying just like Arab Spring, the West knows the rebellion's coming, Russia knows it's coming, so they pre-trigger it so they can then control it, discredit it later. And even worse, the prime minister today is saying he's accusing Russia of trying to invade Ukraine based upon the same phony information that I just uh, uh, told your audience about in Crimea. This is not Russian troops coming in from outside Crimea. These are Russian troops already in Crimea, Crimea by prior agreement with Ukraine. They're simply shuffling some forces around to make sure that all the military bases are protected. Now, I'm not defending Russia. But they're tweaking the nose of the West, and the Ukrainian, new Ukrainian government is tweaking the nose of, uh, of Russia. But this is all political theater. Nothing is going to happen in a major military way. This is just the onset of continual conflict. And, and getting back to the bigger picture here, it's my estimation, based upon what I've studied about Russian rearmament and China uh, rearmament, or, or actual armament, they aren't rearming, but engaged in massive uh, armament, especially of missile forces, they still aren't going to be ready until at least 2020. And even though they're ready, that doesn't mean that there's going to be a strike in 2020. It's going to be sometime in the next decade, not before. Uh, now, as you get closer to the point when they're ready, if they see an opportunity, it's possible that they could strike earlier than that. So I'm not trying to say that there's a definitive time that anyone, I mean, we're talking about three different multiple conspiracies here. There's no way anyone can say this is going to happen on a certain date. But we can tell when, by their own statements, they feel like they're going to be ready with their newest weapon systems. And everything out of the Russian system and the Chinese talks about post-2020 in terms of being ready with new aircraft carriers, with new submarines, with their new missile systems. And all the while, of course, the U.S. is disarming. We haven't built a, a new missile in 20 years, and we're shooting off what M, uh, Minuteman three missiles we have and not replacing them. I mean, it's an incredible uh, suicidal mission of the West to try to set the stage. And what 
what they have to do, remember, they have to induce Russia and China to strike. As strong as they are getting, they still have, especially Russia, has a lot of decrepit systems, a lot of older systems. Um, they've got quantity. They don't have a lot of quality except in their newest systems, and they're very low in quantity of those things. But the globalists continue to have to disarm to induce them to strike. And the, the big picture I want to put out is, and people don't understand, why is it the globalists would want to bring on a nuclear strike onto America? And it's because you can't get Americans to give up essential freedoms, national sovereignty, and yield to a global government unless the U.S. military gets taken down. If they let the U.S. military get taken down in a preemptive nuclear strike, then they can come out of their bunkers, and our leaders are building huge underground bunkers because they know this strike is coming. If they come out of their bunkers and say, oh, the Russians and Chinese deceived us, we didn't know this was going to happen. But our only salvation now is to join together with NATO and other forces and form a new world government to prosecute this war, and literally everyone will lay down and say, save us, do whatever it takes. We don't care about sovereignty, just do what it takes. That's why this is going to happen. But they do have secret weapon systems. I believe they have space-based weapon systems that are going to be used to stop any further strikes while the West regroups and pulls out a lot of secret military weapons that they've been developing, not to defend us with, but to prosecute this war afterwards. I'm projecting that Russia will be defeated eventually in that war because the West will cut a deal with China to betray Russia and turn on its rear, and Russia can't win. Now here's the advantage for China in that. He gets to eliminate the other third leg of the conspiracy for the New World Order. And then it's only China versus the West. And then the West wants that. They want a reinvigorated China. They'll use, just like we invigorated Russia during World War II by giving them all that aid and lend-lease, we'll do the same with, with China. Because the, the West wanted the Cold War, they wanted this great enemy because it would justify so much more militarization. And the globalists will want an enemy, a Cold War enemy after World War III to justify keeping all of the militarized troops of the world government. And by the way, these same elites stirred up World War I and World War II, and in so many of their writings, they say they need something bigger than a regional war, Rand Corporation and others have said in the last three years they need a world war three to get the anglo-american world government in place so i mean and to keep it militarized alex to keep it militarized they need a war big enough that they've got an enemy on the other side you can't win at all that's why they sabotaged and didn't let us win against russia in fact we let russia sure that's why they didn't let Patton go in and, and, and beat that's stalin right. or macarthur because they wanted to keep him there that's right so we're going to have after world war three a powerful world government with a global military and a global taxation system, a new currency. Remember, you can't have a collapse of the dollar in a new currency unless you have a world government to manage it. They're certainly not going to let, the, if the dollar collapsed, they wouldn't let the Fed reconstitute a new currency. And the Fed isn't going to let control of world finance. That's why I keep saying there's sure. not going to be sure. an economic collapse until this war comes. And that gives the powers to be cover. It's not their fault then if the economy collapses, because war did it. Oh, it's Not clear. Notice they staged 9-11 right as the dot-com went under. Exactly. I mean, they're always pulling stuff so they don't get to blame. Now, I want to go to phone calls, but let me be more domestic here. The constant attack on men, the constant attack on women in traditional roles, the attack on children, the feminization, all of this, what is the goal behind that? I mean, I've, I've got my views on it. I don't think I've ever asked you your views, Joel Skousen, about the war on men. Because it is really kicking into high gear right now. Well, this goes back to what we've talked about before, that at, at the bottom, this is a satanic conspiracy. He's giving direction. This is a real person, just like God is real, fighting against God and all that is good. There's no globalist purpose, you know, for emasculating manhood or destroying Western culture and other things other than the fact or promoting homosexuality for that, unless you want to destroy the moral fiber of a nation. And that's why this multifaceted front that you've so eloquently described is really something that is satanic. And it isn't a uniform conspiracy in the sense that anyone involved is being dictated to. You know, just like God speaks to conscience, Satan's in there all the time as well. And you have innately liberal people, innately immoral people, 
who get those little hints from conscience to go ahead and attack all that is good and to promote that which is evil and to emasculate masculinity and promote.